Hello, hello, everybody. <clears throat> if you have the ability to turn on your camera, would love to see your beautiful faces. Makes this uh, just more interactive, more fun. Get your fingers ready because we are going to be going in the chat today. All right, I want to <clears throat> I want to get this party started today. We are going to be talking about the first day experience. Hello, Miss Jennifer. Um, you know, first impressions do matter. They do last. And we're going to kind of walk through a process on the different aspects of that very first time that a prospect walks into your academy so that we can provide them with a wow experience, with a VIP experience, which ultimately makes converting them uh, into a student that much easier. And I think for, for many of us that have you know been a part of the martial arts industry and we've trained martial arts ourselves, we can often feel kind of separated from that, the first day feeling, those first day jitters that our prospects go through. And we're really going to look at this through their eyes. So without like hitting all of the different kind of bullet points and aspects of the first day experience, I'd love for you to just think on a scale of one to five, one, it's like a white belt experience. It's, you know, like it's not really that great. We haven't really put that much thought into it. Versus a five being like black belt level experience. We've really thought through every interaction that we're having with this prospects. Three would be kind of somewhere in the middle. So one to five, how would you rate the first day experience that you are providing prospects who come into your school the very first time? So go ahead, get in the chat. Give me a one, a two, a three, a four, a five. All right, seeing a lot of threes right in the middle. See a four, awesome, two to three. Cool. So my my goal today is, is really for you to be able just to take, you know, one to two things that you can implement into this first day experience to turn it into a four or a five. I'm going to ask one more question um, and ask for your feedback in the chat. Hopefully you are keeping stats, right? I'm always saying math is the path. What is the conversion rate? So the percentage from somebody showing up into your school and enrolling into a new student. Is it 50% of them enroll, 60%, 70, 80? Is it less than 50? Um, if you are if you're not sure what that number is, this is your friendly ninja reminder that you absolutely need to be tracking this. Um, but we've got Master Bolts, 50 to 60%. Ms. Chapman, less than 50. Um, enrolled or signed up for a trial, either or. They've made some form of a monetary exchange, basically. Whether they paid you $49 for a trial or they enrolled in a full Student, I know everybody's kind of processes are are slightly different. 50 to 80, 80%, 50%, 60 to 70. At the moment, 70%. I like that, right? Want to be at 90%, but we're not there yet. Okay. Um, I would love for all of you to aim to be 80% or higher. So if 10 people show up into your facility, uh, eight of them are going to commit to becoming a student. I think that's the the number that you should be aiming for. And obviously, if we can get it to 90, we can get it to 95, even better. But 80% is, uh, is the number I want you aiming for. So hello to everybody that's just hopping on. Again, if you have the ability to turn on your cameras, let me know. Mr. We got Mr. Juan Cologne with a brand new baby at home, and he's here. Look at that. Awesome. All right, guys, let me go ahead and share the screen and let's go through this. As we go through each one of these um, like first day processes, I am going to ask you to evaluate yourself on these particular processes. So, you know, at the end of the training, like, okay, these are the ones that I'm not really scoring too high on. And this is where we need to put our focus. What I don't want you to do is Try to implement every single one of these. It's going to be overwhelming and you're really going to set yourself up for failure. So 
We're going to evaluate that first day experience and talk about how we can improve it with just some minor tweaks to help you increase your conversions. We have to look at this not through the eyes of school owners or program directors or instructors. We have to look at this through the eyes of your customer and what they're feeling, what questions they have. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And we're going to talk about how your digital footprint can either set you up for success or it can set you up for failure with first impressions. We'll go through the pre-appointment process, the VIP tour experience, the introductory lesson, uh, the enrollment process, and then onboarding. Because the last thing that we want is some form of a monetary transaction to happen and then buyer's remorse kicks in, right? We definitely don't want that. Uh, always got to go over a code of conduct. You guys put this in your calendar. You showed up on time, which is awesome. We've got the next hour to be engaged and be present, close down Facebook, I always flip my phone over so there's no distractions there. Uh, please participate in the chat. When I ask, it basically provides me with a feedback loop to know, like, are you picking up what I'm throwing down? And feel free to ask questions as we go through this. So the very first time I ever spoke in the martial arts industry was at one of Steven Reinstein's events back in January of 2019. And the topic was on customer journey. And I often pull this into a lot of my trainings because I don't think a lot of schools have really been able to categorize the different stages that our customers go through. And when we can, one, identify what those stages are, and then two, know what the customer is feeling, we can ultimately provide them with a better service. So what we're talking about today are the first three stages of the customer journey, which are these right here in the middle. In order to eventually sign somebody up to become a student, they have to gain awareness that we even exist, right? So first stage of any customer journey, and it doesn't matter if this is a martial arts school, a dance studio, uh, a lemonade stand people need to know that we exist. And that's where it starts with awareness, okay? And this is really where your marketing comes into play. The second stage that they move to is consideration. Once they know you're, a, a, you know, an actual martial arts school and where you're located, they need to make a consideration of, am I going to go with your school? Am I going to go with the competitor school down the road? Or Maybe we're not even going to do martial arts, period, and we've decided we you know, are going to be a soccer family or a baseball family. And then the third stage from consideration is ultimately to get that enrollment, to, to get the, the purchase. And after they become a student, then we onboard them. Then we want to keep them with retention strategies. And ultimately, I believe we all want to make our students advocates of our programs. And what's so cool about the customer journey is that it cycles because once you make a student an advocate or a brand ambassador um, of your school, that ultimately ends up bringing more awareness. And then the cycle starts all over again. So what we're going to be talking about today are these first three stages um, of awareness, consideration, and purchase, and, and really honing in where can we make some tweaks. Um, what you'll notice so in the middle here are the six stages. Up at the top, we have the departments that are responsible, that have touch points with our students and their families while they're at that stage, right? So in the awareness stage, that's really like our marketing that is out there that's getting more eyeballs on our school. From then, then in the consideration stage, it's not just the, the marketing we're doing, it's also our sales process and the level of customer service that we offer. And then once we get them in the school and we're trying to get them to purchase, this again goes back to your sales process, your enrollment process, and your customer service. There are many different things that we can implement at each one of these stages, right? So for awareness, we can uh, focus on word of mouth and our referral programs. We can do print marketing. We could do uh, Facebook ads, social media ads. We could do pay-per-click with Google ads. Our website plays a role. We can put 
bandit signs, little road signs out um, to get the word out. We can email, right? These are all of the different little things that we can do, but often what we don't consider is what is the prospect or customer going through? What, what is their objectives? What are the questions that they have? So I know this is kind of small, so let me zoom in a little bit for you. So at the awareness stage, when somebody is becoming aware of our school, really like their objective is to figure out like logistically, is this going to work? And do I even have an interest in doing martial arts? If, you know, this person lives 100 miles away, logistically, that's not going to work for them. The questions that are involved are, you know, where are they located? What programs do they offer? If it's a mom that's really looking for um, a specific women's self-defense class, but you don't offer that, you might not offer the services that they're looking for. And also the ages, right? Uh, we start them as young as three years old. We have a three and four-year-old Tiny Ninjas program, but I know not all schools start them that young. So these are some of the questions that you know they're, they're going to have. And really the touch point is kind of one-sided. This is them you know, seeing your road signs or seeing your feather flags, seeing your online ads and the emotions that they are feeling is usually intrigue. Oftentimes what I'll see in terms of the weakness of martial arts schools on their end in the awareness stage is that they're not providing the information that that person is looking for, okay? And, you know, the famous saying, like, walk a mile or two in somebody else's shoes to really understand what they're going through. We have to look at this through their perspective. Once they're aware of us and, you know, we've gotten them intrigued and now they're considering it, their next objective is they want more information. And usually what's the first question they're, they're asking? Like, what's the cost, right? How much is it? Also, though, they're considering what's the environment like? Is this a family-friendly environment that I want my child to be in? Does the schedule work? Um, you know, there is like a, 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 a right way to set up a schedule and a not right way. And what type of customer service are we providing? Are we really trying to learn more about them or are we just trying to spewing out information to book the appointment? OK, so those are their objectives and some of the questions. And typically the first point of contact that happens at the consideration stage is going to be like email, text message or a phone call. Right. And, and we call those the, the trifecta. We want to make sure that we are offering all three of those touch points, the emotions. Um, you know, we're a BJJ and MMA school choking people out, arm barring people. Uh, for some, you know, if this is their first experience with martial arts and maybe the only thing they've ever seen is, you know, what's going on in Cobra Kai or the Karate Kid, there's sometimes nervousness and apprehension and excitement. And I think this aspect of that emotion, oftentimes school owners and staff can be so pulled away from it because this is just our day to day, right? Arm barring people, choking people, punching and kicking. That's our day to day. That's the norm. But for your prospects, it's not. Okay. A weakness that we can have is a lack of trust building in this process when we are communicating. And then we bring them to the purchase stage. And this is really where their journey will begin. And we want to make sure that there isn't any buyer's remorse when we get to this purchase stage. So we've got to make sure we answer the question, what's next? What's going to happen after I become a student? And that really brings us to onboarding. The main touch point here is going to be face to face once they're in your facility, but you're going to continue to follow up via phone, email, and text message. Oftentimes, the emotions, they're giddy, but they are still nervous. And where a lot of school owners drop the ball here and their weakness is they have a weak sales process, or which I see very often, the owner themselves are a part of the process and they're, they don't have like a duplicatable process. Their personality, their excitement can really kind of help to get the sale. But unless you always want to be a one man or one woman show, we have to have replicatable processes. So I think it's important to kind of understand like what are the, what is the customer going through? What questions do they have? What emotions do they have? So that we can set up our systems to, to meet them. Okay. Um, the, the last 
touch point on this that I want to make in the awareness stage, because I do see this as, as a mistake often, is that your, your online marketing, your digital presence doesn't always speak to your ideal customer. And you have to understand that what they are seeing online is, is kind of one of the first, first impressions that they are getting. And we're going to dive into that a little bit, a little bit more. Um, I had this really cool experience um, about two weeks ago. It was my my wife's birthday and, and we were celebrating with another couple. And we went to a brand new restaurant that we had never been to. It was called Meat Market. And um, when I think about the experience that I had with Meat Market, I believe it, it really was like a VIP first class experience. And I always like looking at what other businesses are doing outside of the martial arts industry to see how they are treating their customers. And one of the things that I noticed with Meat Market is not only did they send confirmation texts for the reservation, they also called. And what I loved about when they called, they wanted to make sure that we understood what the dress code was. They have a very specific dress code that they require in order to eat at this restaurant. And the dress code it deter is determined by are you eating outside on the patio? Are you indoors? And also, is this like lunch or dinner? Could you imagine if they didn't tell us about the dress code or there was only maybe one way that they told us? And in this case, there were multiple. It was in an email. It was in a text message. And it was in the phone call to make sure that all of us would be dressed appropriately. What type of experience would I have had if I showed up wearing clothes that wouldn't have allowed us to sit inside. I'd probably be pretty ticked off and I wouldn't want to go there because I spent the time to get ready to drive down there, make the reservation, and now I can't even eat inside. So they did a really, really great job on the front end of communication with that. The second we sat down, uh, the waiter brought, I don't even, it was basically like fried corn. They had a specific name for it. It was the most delicious little snack that like I, I've had in a really, really long time. And they said it was, you know, from, from the chef. And I really loved that because I was hungry. I had like saved up my macros and calories for the day. Cause I knew we were going to have a big meal. So I was really hungry when I sat down and instantly there was food on the table. Um, this is just a sidebar. This is pretty cool. We sat next to John Cena, which if you're like a WWE fan, that was just like the club was like, oh my gosh, I'm sitting next to John Cena, right? So that, that was just a little sidebar. And then they come over and they hand us a warm towel um, after our appetizer to clean our hands, which always feels really nice. And after dinner, uh, Ruth's Chris does this as well. Prior to bringing out desserts, they have a little bread scraper and they use this scraper to kind of clean the table off so that, you know, when dessert comes out, everything is nice and clean. And these are just some examples that to me is what would provide a VIP experience. Now, with everything that I just stated, you see the picture of the, the restaurant. This is the actual picture of the meat market, um, you know, delivering food immediately. You're sitting next to a celebrity, which, you know, I mean, that's outside of their control. But man, that, you know, kind of raises the bar of the restaurant. They're giving you warm hand towels. There's a bread scraper. Do you think this was a restaurant that, uh, you know, had a, a very cheap bill? Or was it probably a pretty expensive restaurant to eat at? I'm here to tell you, it was a very expensive restaurant to eat at. But to me, the experience and also the food, which was phenomenal, matched what was given and the price point, okay? People are going to make an impression the second they walk into your facility. And if you're trying to increase your rates, if you're trying to attract a more affluential um, family, you got to ask yourself, like, does our place represent that? Okay, and we're going to talk about the senses here in a second. So before we dive into like features and benefits and, and value, I do want to touch on the importance of your digital presence and what it looks like. More often than not, if you're going on Amazon and you're looking to purchase something, you probably scroll to the bottom and you check the reviews, 
right? Amazon really was like one of the major companies that changed the way people listen to reviews. 15 years ago, like nobody trusted online reviews. Today they do. Your Google reviews, your website, your social media accounts are providing impressions to your prospects. And you've got to ask yourself, like, are we starting off on like with a good foot forward based off of what people see online with our website, with the reviews, with the Facebook recommendations and with what we are posting on social media or not? And, you know, it's, it's it's so interesting to me that here we are 2024, there's still so many websites that look like they were built in, in the early 2000s. They're not mobile optimized. There's uh, it's very difficult for readability. I see so many schools that have like single digit Google reviews. And one of the questions I, I want you to ask yourself is over the years that you have been operating your martial arts school, how many lives do you think you've changed? I mean, depending on how long you've been around, it's probably hundreds, if not thousands. I want your Google reviews to match that. So if you're at like seven reviews, are you telling me there's only seven people's lives that you changed? And <clears throat> here's the thing, guys. If somebody sees your Facebook ad and they click on your Facebook ad, guess who else's Facebook ads they're going to start seeing? They're going to start seeing all your competitors because Facebook now puts them in an audience of people that are interested in martial arts. And I want to make sure that when they're looking you up and they're going to your website and they're looking at your Google reviews, you at least get the first bat opportunity. It might not mean you're going to get the student, but I at least want you to get the first at bat. And I don't think enough of us really understand how our digital presence affects the impression that people have on our business, because that's that's what they're judging you based off of until they actually get to talk to you, okay? So when we're talking about the um, first day experience, we've got features, we've got benefits, and we have values. And oftentimes, most business owners focus on the feature, okay? They focus on, you know, the type of style that they are, are teaching, um, and just really like what it is we offer. And there's nothing wrong with touching on the features, but what you can't do is end there. And features are just factual statements about what it is we do and what we offer, okay? Then you have the benefit. And the benefit is what that feature does for the customer. It describes how the features of our school improves the experience or solves their problem. And that's really what we have to do is we have to relay to our prospects that we know how to solve the problem that they are having, whether that is a parent who has a child that is very shy and they want to instill more confidence or a parent who has a child that is a little rambunctious and they want to instill more discipline. Okay. The last part that we don't often talk about is the value. And the value is the broader importance or impact of owning and using the product. And the value to each person is going to be different based off of what problem they are trying to solve. So I wanted to kind of give you like an actual example in the martial arts to break down, like in your school, the difference between the feature, the benefit and the, and the value. So, you know, the feature explained could be at our martial arts school, we categorize students into four distinct learning developmental stages. So like we teach a three and four year old class, five to seven, eight to 10, 11 and up, um, kind of similar to Melody Johnson skills programs where, re where she really focuses on those different developmental stages. And each group is tailored to the physical, cognitive and social developmental range, age range that they're in, right? We don't have an expectation that three-year-olds can do perfect push-ups, right? We don't even have an expectation that six-year-olds can do that, okay? So the, the, the feature is, hey, we have different age groups for our classes, okay? The benefit, and here's the thing, you have benefits that benefit the kids, and then you also have benefits that benefit the parents. Same thing with values, so we ensure that the training is age appropriately age appropriate so it's effective. There are certain things that you should 
not be teaching five-year-olds that you can absolutely teach 10-year-olds. For example, with younger students, we typically have them do more games and more basic motor skill activities, which are crucial at that developmental stage. While with the older students, we might focus more on discipline and technique and complex combinations. And again, this approach enhances their learning. It helps to keep students engaged. Melody calls these roller coaster classes where if you have like a three-year-old and a six-year-old where the what you're teaching might be too difficult um, for the three-year-old or too easy for the six-year-old. And ultimately, the benefit is that it prevents feelings of frustration and boredom. What's cool to a six-year-old is different than what's cool to a four-year-old. What's cool to a 12-year-old is different than what's cool to a seven-year-old. It's not just a one-size-fits-all class. The benefits to the parent is that the parent can be confident that their child is receiving instructions that's not only safe for their age, but also optimized for that particular stage of development. And it also ensures that we can provide a more personalized learning experience. Then we move on to the value. So what is, what is the value to the family? For the child, it's just much more fun. It's much more enjoyable. Guess who else it's also much more enjoyable for? The instructors, right? The instructors, for sure. For the parents, there's peace of mind that comes from knowing their child in an environment that supports their growth and nurtures their individual needs, okay? Oftentimes, we focus just so much on saying like, oh, we separate our kids by age groups but you don't highlight the benefit and the value that this brings to the kid and to the parent. And when you do that, ultimately what happens is emotion gets tied to this and that's what's gonna make the conversion. That connection, that emotion is gonna make the conversion that much easier. So we're gonna go through some of the aspects of the first day. And it really starts with the pre-appointment process. So I want you to go ahead and write down pre-appointment process. And I know, you know, everybody's is, is probably slightly different. I want you to invite you to kind of come with an open mind on how can you improve the pre-appointment process? Because this is really where these first impressions are occurring. Um, I'll, I'll give you a real life example. There is a Taekwondo school that's literally in walking dis distance from my office. And my wife has to kind of drive by our office to take our son, uh, our son Cruz home after school. And I believe at his age group, Taekwondo is going to be a little bit better fit than jujitsu. My journey was Taekwondo first, and then I did jujitsu a little bit later on. So I went to the website of this Taekwondo school. And I opted in. I put my name, I put my email, I put my phone number. After I opted in, it just said, a team member will reach out to you. This was probably over two months ago. Team member still has not reached out to me. Haven't gotten any emails. There weren't any text messages. Okay, That is the example of the pre-appointment experience that your prospects might be having as well. Does that, do you think, leave like a good taste in my mouth or maybe a not so good taste in my mouth, right? They, they, they haven't even picked up the phone to give me a call. Something to consider, right? What does that digital presence look like and how does that affect our, our uh, prospects? So the pre-appointment process, once somebody opts in and they have received the phone call or they've opted in and they wanted for more information, one of the things that we do is we send this picture. And this is something we set up for our GrowPro clients. If you're a GrowPro client and don't have this set up, let us know, we can get it set up. And basically that whiteboard right there, we superimpose the person's name on it. So it's personalized to whatever name they opted in. So in this case, it says, Michael, we're so excited to meet you and your child. And it's signed with the coach's name and the Gracie Pack team. It's personalized, right? It's not, it is automated, but it's also personalized. And then what we do is we provide them with a link to book into our calendar. And the reason why I love this is, I don't know about you, but we get a lot of opt-ins 
outside of our normal business hours. Nine o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, midnight sometimes, super early in the morning before parents are going to work and we don't have anybody inside. And what this does with their experience is it streamlines it so that they don't have to wait. If I would have opted into that Taekwondo school's website and I got a text message with a booking link, what do you think I would have done? I would have booked the appointment right then and there. These types of automations can help improve what the customer is going through, okay? Um, I used to bring my car to a uh, detailer place right around the corner. And my schedule started getting a little hectic and they had text messaging capabilities, which I really like, I appreciated. Uh, me personally, I'm, I'm a texter over a phone call. I know some people are other, but your customers might prefer to communicate that as well. And we were constantly in this back and forth of like, they would ask, can you do Wednesday at 12? And I'm like, no. And then they're like, can you do Thursday at two? And I'm like, no. And, and I'm asking, can you do Friday at one? And they're like, no. And it's this back and forth and back and forth. And I'm just thinking like, can you just send me a calendar link? That way at my convenience, based off of my schedule, I can book and they don't have that. So guess what? I don't bring my car there anymore. And I use this app called Spiffy, which I click the button, I pick the date. And then guess what? They magically show up on that time and date to do my car. There's convenience in it for me. I value that, right? So if you're not offering that capability to your prospects, are you losing out like the Taekwondo school that's right around the corner from me? Because I haven't gotten a follow-up, okay? So I want you to ask yourself, and, and maybe it's time for you to do a little bit of an audit of I mean, when's the last time you opted into your website and you saw, you know, what, what are they going through? Are the offers, you know, up to date? Now, once they book an appointment, and I've talked about this a million times, and I'm going to continue to talk about it a million times because there's plenty of people that have heard me talk about it a million times and they still don't do it. We send a video of a tour of our facility in the confirmation sequence once they book. So imagine somebody books an appointment with you and it could even be they booked it over the phone. But now they have an appointment, so now they're going to get a confirmation and they get an email or a text message with this welcome video, okay? Um, I'm, going to, I'm not going to play this. Oops, let me see. I'm just going to drop this in the chat just for time purposes. So if you want to, um, if you want to check this video out, you can. But what we did is we filmed this video. What I don't want you to do is see professional video editing because we did it. You, you can do this literally with your cell phone. The purpose of this is to build the no like, and trust factor. It's to tell your prospects, hey, when you come in, ABC is going to happen. And then when they show up, if ABC happens, guess what you've just built with them? You've built trust. Okay. And much easier to get the conversion if they trust you. Also. Not many of your competitors are doing this. It's just another way to elevate the experience. And remember, at this stage, in this consideration stage, where they're booking appointments and they're considering signing up for martial arts, there's apprehension and there's nerves that are involved. This helps to kind of lower that for your prospects, okay? I host this on our Market Muscles website, could you just throw it up on YouTube? You could, but then the link that you're sending out is a YouTube link um, and you can't really control like what videos they see after, what type of ads are being served. Um, so we just, it, it is hosted on YouTube, but we embed it on our Market Muscle site because then if you look at the URL, it's branded. It says graciepack.com and then it's got the forward slash pack welcome, which I just think from a, uh, professionalism standpoint, it's just slightly more professional than just sending a YouTube video, but you could absolutely just send the YouTube link. Okay. Once they, you know, opted in, they booked and they're on the confirmation. What does the confirmation sequence look like? I want you to think of like confirmation sequences you get from your dentist, confirmation sequences you get from the DMV. Do they feel like warm and fuzzy or does it feel kind of like 
clinical and just here's the date and here's the time, right? It's the latter. How can you add a little bit higher level of this is who we are? Just send a selfie picture attached to the text message confirmation. And again, this is automated. This is you set this up once and it's just done, okay? Um, let me look at the chat. They need grow protocol up on prospects. Yes. Is it in Canva and can you automate the name? So this here is not done through Canva. This is done through a, a separate software. Um, the name of the software is escaping me just because I'm not the one that's setting this up for our clients, but I will get you the name. Um, but basically it's uh, just code that pulls in the name from, from the opt-in. Your CRM would also have to have the capabilities of doing this. So like GrowPro clients that use high level, we can do this for them. Okay. Um, all right. And then Chris, is this something you can build? Yes, absolutely. Michelle, we can absolutely do this. Uh, we just call this the whiteboard image. So if you want to reach out to your ad account manager and just say, hey, I'd like to get the whiteboard image um, implemented into the opt-in sequence. We just need a picture of, it could be the program director. It could be the um, uh, instructor. We need them standing, pointing at something. It could be a TV. It could be a whiteboard. They could hold up a little whiteboard. We just need something, some object that we can superimpose it. In terms of the video tour, yes. If you give us the URL, we can update the confirmation sequence to put that URL in there. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So we talked about what your prospects are going through during the opt-in. Once they book, what kind of nurture sequences are they getting? Does it feel like very clinical and dry? Or is it really showcasing who you are and, and, and you know, who your people are? Um, so you'll notice in the tour, you know, the, it's our program director who is who they're going to be spending the majority of the time in. And then the confirmation is the person that they're doing the introductory lesson with, which for us is the instructor. So take a second and under your, your pre-appointment process, I want you to score yourself one to five. How are you doing so far? One, two, three, four, or five. And also consider, guys, your Google reviews, what your website looks like, what your social media looks like. All of those things play a role into this. Got a three, twos, got a zero. Okay, we got to start somewhere, right? 4.1493. Nice, sir. I love it. Cool. So it seems like we do have a little bit of room of improvement. Guys, just pick one of these, right? Is it, um, you know, I work with GrowPro and I want them to set up the whiteboard. We can get that done, right? Is it, I want to get the tour video. One thing about the tour that's really important, especially if you're around a lot of other competitors, is I want you to show them what the parking lot looks like. Because I want you to think, most of your introductory lessons are probably around like 5 p.m., 6 p.m., 4 p.m., which is during rush hour traffic. And what I want to make it is just super simple that if they're stressed out and they're in like bumper to bumper traffic, the second they see our parking lot, they already know like, oh, I'm where I'm supposed to be. This is very important if you're not in like a strip mall that has a lot of road signage. For us, we're in an industrial park. And you've got to kind of zigzag. So we show them this is where you can park and this is what our building looks like. And again, if you're near competitors, what I would hate is that they show up to the wrong place. So now they at least have a visual of what your school looks like. Cool? And guys, they haven't even entered the door. And can you see how these things can help build a better first impression prior to them entering? 100%. Okay? All right. So next up. Let's talk about the arrival. Okay, so they booked the appointment, they got the confirmations, they're coming in, and now they arrive, okay? So we really need to look at this through the five senses. What are they seeing? What are they hearing? What are they tasting? Are you offering water bottles? Are you offering them a, a cup of coffee? What are they touching? right? The chair that they're sitting in, is it ripped up like the one that I'm sitting in right now? Or is it, you know, nice and fresh? What are they smelling? Those especially important for those of you with large adult programs. Um, it's, it's funny, but it's not funny. So many of you know, I sold my school in January and I sold it to a UFC fighter. And our kids program has always been booming. 
it was our adult program. We were like 95% kids, 5% adults and waiting lists in, in some cases for some of the kids age groups. The adult program was never something we really focused on. So Billy, when he purchased the school, that's where his focus is, right? He's a UFC fighter. He loves coaching and working with adults. And about a month after the purchase happened, um, one of our instructors is getting married and he had a party and he invited some of the parents that he's developed close relationships with. And I was there and some of these parents actually train and then others don't, their kids just train. So I said, all right, guys, give it to me. Give me the good, give me the bad and give me the ugly, you know, because this was a big transition. And I also wanted to make sure that I could have helped Billy during this transition um, because I want to see the school be successful. Their only piece of feedback, they were like, honestly, it's like you've never left except for one thing. Those adults stink. And it's their gear. And because we're having a lot more adults in the school than we were it, because Billy's putting all of his focus on that, all of the ads are for the adult program and not the kids, you got some stinky gear coming in the school, right? And that, like, our school never smelled bad. So that is an example of like, and for some of you, you might be used to the smell in, in your school, right? It's like people that have a ton of dogs and cats, they just kind of get used to that smell in their house. And then somebody comes in, it's like, man, it smells like there's a lot of animals living here. So we really need to do this. And we need to do this. To me, this needs to be something that you're assessing consistently, like on a quarterly basis. Um, I went to Matt Arroyo's school this morning and he's got a beautiful location. It's like 10,000 square feet. And one of the things he used to be really, really good at was repainting the walls and the baseboards and the concrete flooring. He's got concrete flooring. And anybody that's ever had concrete flooring that you paint over, guess what happens? The paint chips. And it's something that you have to consistently repaint. And I was like, Matt, when was the last time you redid these floors and the wall? And he's like, I know, I know, I know. We sometimes get decent. And I hadn't been in his school in like over a year. It had been a really long time. They did a lot of work. They knocked some walls down. They extended the mats. And you become so desensitized to it because you're in it all the time. Sometimes you need to maybe ask somebody that's not in it, right? Maybe ask like one of your, you know, mom friends to come in and like, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? And what are you smelling? How can we make this better? Okay. But people are judging you guys a hundred percent. They are judging you on what they are seeing, what they are hearing, what they are tasting, the touch and the smell. Okay. So when somebody uh, arrives, another thing I, I want you to consider is what does your parking lot look like? Is there a bunch of trash outside? Is this a conversation that maybe you need to have with your landlord that somebody needs to be coming? Um, one of the conversations I had to have with our landlord is that the lamps outside, a lot of them were flickering or were completely off. If somebody's coming into a late appointment, maybe at eight o'clock and it's completely dark outside, that's a safety hazard. When's the last time you really assessed like the parking lot? Because that's going to be the first thing that they see, right? Also, um, when they when they come in, this is a really cool example from Blake Harris. He's one of our Maya clients and one of our Grow Pro clients. He has the staff to be able to do this, but literally they have somebody that opens the door for people as they come in. Like kind of like talking like next level Disney stuff, right? So I'd love for you to assess, is the school organized? Is it structured? Is it orderly? Is it clean? What are they hearing? What's the music? We see this a lot with BJJ and MMA academies playing music that is not family friendly. Um, is there just like a dead vibe? That's not fun to walk into either, especially if you're doing these intros at like three o'clock, four o'clock when classes aren't going on. Like what is the atmosphere that we are creating? We want to create a little bit of excitement. We don't want it to just be dead air. Are you offering water and coffee for the taste? The touch of the seats the pens. When's the last time you replaced your pens? Are you using an iPad? Does the iPad have a crack in the screen? And I'm giving these examples because we used to have an iPad that had a crack in the screen. Hey, maybe we should go get that fixed. And really the smell, does it smell clean? Right. And there are definite things that you can do besides cleaning protocols, but also putting air fresheners that are on timers that will shoot out. Okay. 
The other thing about the arrival that I want you to consider is something, it's either, I think it's the Hyatt or the Hilton that implemented this. It's called the five foot, 10 foot rule. And it comes from the hospitality industry. And basically what it is, is if you see somebody that's about 10 feet away from you, you need to make some form of eye contact and wave. So if they're 10 feet away, you make eye contact and you wave. If they're five feet away, then there is a verbal recognition that they are in your presence. And this is something that they train hospitality staff on. Is this a conversation you can have with your team? Because in our school, we want the second somebody walks through the door, if it's a student or a prospect, they are being greeted and their name is being stated. Okay, so kind of a really easy thing that you can train your team on this five foot, 10 foot rule, okay? So once they walk in, one of the very easy kind of wowzer bowser things that you can do is to have some form of a welcome kit or welcome package on the desk for their arrival, okay? We bought these off of Amazon. It's just a little tray. And then we bought this little, um, it's like a little chalkboard. You could do a white dry erase. <laughs> Prior to buying that, we used to print it out on card stock and like, that's not efficient. Just get a white dry erase board or a little chalkboard. Uh, we put a water bottle. Next, next level, offering some form of a book. If this is a child, um, now, this is what we do for a paid trial that is coming in, meaning they've already gone online. They've paid us either the $29 or the $49. If somebody is just coming in for a free one-on-one, -on -one, we don't do the book, but we do put the uniform and the belt. Chris, how do you know what size they are? We guesstimate. What this is just showcasing to the prospect is you guys took the time and cared about knowing that they had an appointment. And there is a very impressive manner and, and thing that occurs when you walk in and you see your name. It's like, oh, they, they really do care about this appointment that I took time out of my day. So in terms of cost, I mean, you know, the tray and the, the whiteboard, maybe 15, 20 bucks. Um, and this really, really sets a wow example. All right. And then when we go into the enrollment process, we can bring that tray in with the uniform and we can go through what our new student kit looks like. OK. Also, part of the arrival, you need to consider what your intake process looks like. OK. The intake process really allows you to start the conversation, make the connection and then have the conversion. OK. Um, I have a, a four year old son named named Cruz. And I have learned the major difference between communicating with Cruz and connecting with Cruz. If I really want him to do something, whether that's, hey, it's time to go, uh, you know, do our, our, our bedtime routine or our bath routine. If I just kind of shout it across, you know, like, hey, Cruz, time to do bath. He's like, no, I want to keep playing. But if I get down on his level and I look at him in the eyes and I say, hey, I had a lot of fun playing with you today but we got to start heading over to the bath so we can start playing in the bath. And I make that connection. The conversion happens, right? There's no like, no, I want to keep playing. It's the same thing that I, I think we focus so much on the communication, but we forget the connection aspect and your intake process can really, um, you know, open, open the eyes to what it is they want. Now you should have asked this on the phone. OK, but this allows you to really dig a little bit deeper as I don't care if you do a paper. This is just off of the Maya Edge website and you guys will get these these uh, this keynote. We'll we'll blast it out. I don't care if you use paper and pen, if you build this in, you know, your CRM and use an iPad. But you need to be asking these types of questions on what specifically do you want your child to um, accomplish in our in your martial arts? Is there any medical concerns should we be aware of? What type of student are they? What school do they go to? Very important if you want to develop partners in education. You'll get a list of all the schools that your students are going to, which can help you kind of get a foot in the door, okay? And then label on a scale of one to four the importance of self-confidence, physical fitness, self-discipline, and self-defense, okay? 
If I know that their number one reason why they are there is self-confidence, I can now personalize the introductory lesson to focus more on that aspect versus if they were there for physical fitness. But you're not going to know unless you ask. And yes, you can absolutely verbalize this, but there's a lot of power when somebody takes pen to paper or they physically have to type it out, okay? So what I want you to do is considering the arrival, the five senses from the parking lot to walking into your facility to how they are being greeted, how quickly is that happening? What, is there anything there ready for them? And what this intake process looks like. Rate yourself one to five. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Rosenthal says, awesome box practice. Thank you, sir. Out of four, love it. Awesome. Very cool. And guys, again, these are just small little tweaks, right? This isn't like some massive system that is going to take months and months to implement. These are small little tweaks. Now I want to talk about the VIP tour. And depending on the setup of your school, that's going to kind of, you know, determine what this looks like. Um, I was actually very fortunate that when Gracie Pack started, um, it was a vanilla shell, our, our latest location. So I got to build it out to like exactly the way that I wanted it for optimal flow. And, you know, I've got 5,000 square feet. So my tour is probably going to be a little bit more than if you had a thousand square feet or 1500 square feet. Okay. But I'm going to walk you through what ours looks like and some of the major points that we do with our tour. Okay. Um, and ideally when you're giving a tour, it should be benefit driven. So these are all of the different areas that we hit as we're walking through. We've got lobby one, got the coffee bar stages of development, our curriculum and our app, uh, lobby two, menu marketing, and then it brings them to the intro. So I'm just going to kind of give you a, an explanation and some some pictures here. So this is um, an example of our lobby number one, and we explain the benefits to the parents of actually sitting down and watching class and being a part of their martial arts experience. We let them know if you want to pick me up, you know, we've got free coffee located. So if I would have just said like, hey, if you want free coffee, it's located over there. That's the feature. If you want to pick me up, that's the benefit. See the difference? We want to tie that into the tour, okay? Um, it also gives us an opportunity to talk to them about our Google reviews. Um, so we do have a sign um, where we do ask for Google reviews because people are most likely to give you a Google review right in the beginning of their experience because they're the most excited about it, okay? We then bring them over to a wall that explains the stages of development, which was the example that I gave in the beginning when we were talking about features and benefits and value. And we show them this is the, the program and the age group that their child will be in. We then showcase them where the curriculum is and gives us an opportunity to talk about our app, which offers all of our curriculum, which is a huge benefit and value add to the parent. So in case you guys are out of town or Johnny is sick and he can't make class, he can actually see what the curriculum is for testing on the app. It's one thing to just say, hey, we have an app that's got a bunch of you know, curriculum. Well, how does that benefit them? Well, it benefits them because if they miss class or they go on vacation or they can't make it, they'll be able to keep up with what everybody else is learning. We have a second lobby area that has high top tables and this is where we talk to them about, you know, if you're a, a busy professional and you want to get some work done, a lot of our parents come over here and they're able to get some work done. We also offer free Wi-Fi. And then we bring them to a lot of uh, programs, call it like a program board. We call it menu marketing. But this is where we're able to start planting the seeds about the different programs and upgrade programs. We use different belt ranking systems for the kids as well. Believe it or not, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, when they first started, like the belt ranks for kids, there were only four ranks and you can't get a black belt. It was white, yellow, orange, and green. Like it could be years before a kid would go from one rank to the next. So we explained that, you know, we implemented these different belt ranking systems so the kids could have extrinsic rewards and we're constantly highlighting their progress. Gives us an opportunity to also plant the seed about the leadership program. Okay. So 
this is just our example of some of the areas that we hit with the VIP tour. Um, so I'd love for you to just take a minute and rate yourself. How are you doing on your VIP tour? And maybe, maybe it's not even a part of your process and, and maybe it's something you want to consider. Depending on the layout of your school, maybe it doesn't even, you know, really make sense. Okay, next up is the intro. And we're kind of wrapping up towards the end here. So I'm going to go a little bit faster. Um, guys, there's many different ways to skin a cat. We love doing a one-on-one -on -one intro. We believe nothing builds better rapport. You need the mat space to do it and you need the... Uh, hands, the the instructors to be able to do this, right? So it might not make sense for you to do a one-on-one. -on -one. It might make more sense for you to do a group class, but we do do a one-on-one. -on -one. And we have a checklist of what the one-on-one -on -one is going to be. It's up on the wall, right where they're going to do the introductory lesson. And it's just a way for us, again, to like say, hey, we're going to do ABC. And then we actually do ABC, okay? Okay. There's three things, Mr. Metzger taught this to me back in 2015, and it was a really big light bulb moment that should happen in an introductory lesson. One, and I think this is obvious, we've got to build rapport with the child. We're like, yeah, duh. Two, we got to build rapport with the parent. And oftentimes we're so focused on the child that we don't build that rapport with the parent. But number three, and not a lot of, not a lot of schools do this, you want to build rapport between the parent and the child under your roof under your roof, right? We want them to build a connection with martial arts. And one of the ways that we're able to do that is in the introductory lesson, we have specific times where we'll tell the kid, run over to mom and dad, give them a high five and a fist bump and thank them for bringing you here. It's an example of how you can build rapport. You can ask the parent to come on the mat to hold a target for you, right? Another thing that we love to do is when the child is doing really well in the intro, we'll look over to mom and, you know, maybe they're there because Johnny's a little rambunctious and you'll say, mom, you ever seen Johnny be this focused before? So these are all systems that you can build into the intro to make sure you are building rapport with the parent and the child and between the parent and the child. Okay. And also you want to use that intake form that I showed you earlier to personalize the one-on-one -on -one intro. Spend a little bit more time highlighting what they are really there for, okay? And we always want a little bit of sweating, not a lot. You don't want to kill them. I think this is a big mistake that a lot of BJJ and MMA schools make, especially with adults. We want to ease them into it. We want them to do a little bit of sweating, a little bit of smiling, and a little bit of learning. Right, And those are like, okay, if we can check those three boxes off, it was a successful intro. So rate yourself one to five. What does your intro process look like? And we've got two more. I know I'm going over a little bit, probably going to go over five minutes. If you have a one o'clock appointment, my apologies. Uh, my pacing was a little bit slow today, um, but we are going to send out the recording. So I understand if you have to hop off. All right. I'm seeing some higher ones here, which is great. Awesome. And then that brings us to the enrollment process. Um, we've done a full training for our GrowPro clients, Maya clients. This should look very familiar, the four-step enrollment process. Um, you need to have a replicatable system that you and your team can follow during the enrollment. And at Maya, we call it the four-step enrollment process. So, you know, once that intro is over, uh, bringing them into, we have a, a, a separate office um, you know, I think there's arguments, you know, having offices, not having offices for us. We want to have an area where we can have, you know, like conversations and especially like if it's a crucial conversation that we need to have, but we talk about the student. So we're going to dive a little bit more deep and you can use that intake form on there. You know, oh, you know, on the intake form it says, you know, you're interested in Johnny developing more self-confidence. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Can you give me some specific examples of times that he's not showing confidence? Then you're going to be specific about how your program teaches the benefit that they are looking for, okay? Step number three, if you do upgrade programs, you need to plant the seed on the upgrade program. Uh, we have visual upgrade programs, so it's it's shown with the uniform. So we'll say, do you see all the kids in you know, the, the black uniforms or the blue uniforms or the red uniforms, whatever the color is? Um, and we're basically using this to showcase one social proof that, man, there's a ton of kids that are on three-year programs here at our school. 
We let them know that there's a nomination process and that, you know, the majority, 80% of our school is on this program. But what it also does is it makes the 12 month program not seem nearly as long. And we do want to plant the seed that eventually we want Johnny to be on one of these higher level programs. And then we present the program and pricing options. We use a flip book, like to keep it super simple, right? Not a lot of our team are, are going through rigorous sales processes like they do in a lot of other industries, but we use a flip book where there's a cover sheet. We explain the family plans. We explain if you want to pause, which is our extended time guarantee. You want to kind of bring up these objections prior to them having it. And then we go over that there's four ways for them to pay and there's an option for everybody. Really try to hone in on the savings. And one of the things I really want to get a point, uh, the point across is that this isn't a presentation, it's a conversation. This shouldn't you just be regurgitating the information that is on the flip book. And then we show them the monthly options and then uh, are paid in full. And all of our new students have to have a new student kit. Guys, if you are not requiring some form of equipment to be purchased, I mean, if like you have kids, you know, Cruz does soccer. There were things we had to buy for soccer. If he wants to do baseball, there's going to be things that they have to do for baseball. But one of the things that I want you to do is to have that ready in the office so you can pull it out. So bring the tray into the office with the uniform. And if there's other things that are involved, maybe you give a t-shirt, maybe um, you uh, do like a sling bag, maybe you do gloves, depending on what your style is. But you want to have all of those things laid out. And then we just ask what option is best for you. Now, I know I just went through this pretty quickly. Um, if you're a grow pro client, you want to do a training. I had Mr. Shane Tassel come on probably about a couple of years ago. It lives inside of the master classes um, in the grow pro online Academy. I want you to just assess what your current enrollment process is. Even if you're doing something different than this, assess one to five. How good do you feel about your current enrollment process? All right. Got some twos, a three, a four. All right, guys. Awesome. Okay. Once the purchase happens, that's it. But what I don't want you to forget is the onboarding process. We know there's a lot of information we have to collect. And what I don't want is, you know, like in the state of Florida, if you sign an agreement, you've got three days to be able to tear up the contract. And what we don't want is for them to do that within the next three days. So we use what's called an enrollment log. Um, you could, you know, use a digital version of this. We just print a sheet of paper. We just find with certain systems, it's just easier to keep track, but this is where like, okay, we put the program, uh, you know, we, we've got the program laid out. We gave them the schedule. We took a picture of the student because we need to put that in the CRM. We entered them in the CRM and all of the tags that are going to, um, start, you know, pushing automations. Uh, we put them on the attendance roster. We posted about them in the Facebook group. They got a welcome video. They got a, well, whatever it is you do. I'm not saying you need to do all of these, but you do need to have a list of items that post sale, we make sure all of these things occur so nothing slips through the cracks and they're not getting buyer's remorse, okay? Another really big aspect of your onboarding is you've got to be scheduling progress checks to check in. What we don't want is a brand new student to feel like you forgot about them a month later or two months later or three months later. You can automate some of these, but nothing beats that personal touch. You know, Mrs. Johnson, let's go ahead and get 30 days from now, four weeks from now. Let's get an appointment on the books so we can get the time and the date for us to just check in to see how the first four weeks of training has gone for Johnny. Okay. Um, one of the things I did touch on is you can automate this. We do both. So we have 52 emails, one for every week of the first year that they're with us that are aligned with their customer journey. So every week the parent is getting an email. And if they're an adult, the adult is getting an email for the first year with us. And because it's aligned with kind of what they're experiencing at that time, oftentimes they feel like I'm just sitting there and I'm actually typing this out, you know, to them. Because it's like, oh, wow, that's actually exactly what is occurring, right? Like first week for the adults, I think the subject line is like, are you sore yet? Like if you're doing jujitsu for the first time, you better believe after the first week you are sore, right? And what this allows us to do is just to educate the uh, student better on what they are going through. 
And what I did really is we have a new student handbook and it's like 28 pages, it's bounded, it's full color. And we give that to them when they enroll. But how many people do you think really read it? I basically just took a lot of the different talking points from that welcome packet and put it in to that automated sequence. And it's one of those things that, you know, it's probably going to take you a few hours to get done, but once it's done, it's done. And then when you enter them in the CRM, those workflow automations instantly go out. So I just want you to take a second and think about your own personal onboarding system. Once somebody becomes a client, once somebody becomes a student, are we really nurturing those first like 90 days or are we just kind of going out and looking for the next student? Because that's what most schools do. And we want to make sure that that buyer's remorse isn't, isn't there. And especially for those of you that are doing upgrades, if you want to make the upgrade program better, then make the onboarding. If you want to make the ability to upgrade them a higher conversion, then you need to look at what your onboarding process looks like. Okay. And that is how we evaluate our first day experience. I went over a lot because for some of you, as you can see with the ratings, some of you are really low in some areas and some of you are really high in others. Pick one aspect of this. That's it. Just one. And I just want you to commit to doing that one action step. All right, guys. Thanks for showing up today. Thanks for dealing with my voice. No, it's a, a little funky. Uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful Thursday and we'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.